Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and um, I'm sitting in uh, at my mother-in-law's uh, place um, in Oshawa, Ontario. Um, family's visiting her for uh, Easter, so happy Easter to everybody. What I want to uh, talk about um, in this video is a little bit of the uh, meteorology um, of what uh, this massive storm that uh, we experienced, um, you know, and also like it came across the uh, northeast uh, U.S., came up into Canada, and uh, it was quite an unusual event. So talk about that. So basically, um, we had a thunderstorm uh, this past Wednesday, and that, of course, uh, you know, brought, uh, you know, a lot of rain. But before it was the rain, it was a, it was, uh, we had thunder snow, and then we had uh, thunder uh, freezing rain, if you like, or, th or thunder ice, uh, you might call it. And, uh, you know, all of this stuff was in one day. The last video I posted was in the morning during the freezing rain part. So let me just give you a little chronology of the day and uh, talk about some of the consequences and effects and of course it's got climate change written all over it you know the jet streams are acting very differently now than they used to um, in guiding and directing storms and uh, you know that for every degree celsius according to the uh, the clappius clapeyron equation uh, there's seven percent more uh, water vapor in the atmosphere that's with every degree Celsius um, increase in temperature. And the physics of that is that there's just, uh, you know, um, warmer air can hold more water vapor, basically. So what happened on during the storm? Uh, there, so it, it started about 9 a.m., freezing rain. It was about minus 2 Celsius, just below freezing in Ottawa. So we had... We had freezing rain, very, very intense freezing rain. And uh, I was walking around uh, during that part of the storm uh, with Newton, my dog, uh, carrying an umbrella. And you could hear the freezing rain uh, pelting off of the umbrella and freezing onto the umbrella. So that lasted for about three hours. And that deposited probably slightly less than uh, an inch um, of, of uh, ice to coat all of the trees and branches and all the surfaces. And uh, it was quite windy, so it would deposit mostly on uh, you know, one side of buildings and covered windows, et cetera. Um, the trees didn't like it, but they, were, they could withstand it. I mean, occasional branches were falling, small branches, et cetera. But the damage to trees is very nonlinear. So if you're below a certain threshold, there's very little damage, and then when you exceed that threshold, uh, the damage becomes much more significant. So the morning's uh, freezing rain uh, was not enough to seriously damage the trees. It didn't cross that threshold, but it was close. So then what happened is, you know, as the temperature was rising slowly throughout the day, we actually transitioned to uh, snowfall. Um, to sleet, to uh, ice pellets, and uh, then and to snowfall for and that happened from about noon till about uh, you know two 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 thirty p.m. So lasted uh, two to three hours um, for that uh, that type of condition, and that didn't add much burden to the what the trees were carrying, but then. Um, at about 2.30 or 3, we had another switch as the temperature went above zero. It went to plus one Celsius, and there was a very, very intense torrential rainfall. And so the water temperature of the raindrops was about plus one Celsius. So when that rain hit the trees and hit the ice-coated branches on the trees, a lot of it froze. Um, a lot of it froze onto the trees, so it added to the burden of the weight. And the threshold for damage um, was exceeded probably about 3.30 or 4 p.m. because about that time, 
the uh, trees started collapsing. Um, there were lots of huge branches that, you know, you'd be walking along the street and you'd hear this almost like a gunshot, you know, as the wood reaches a breaking point and snaps and then, you know, huge branch would fall off the tree or in some cases, uh, you know, trees were actually, actually just broken half. And it was mostly the deciduous trees, you know, with the, like, you know, maples and, uh, you know, elms, different types of deciduous trees where they have long uh, branches and the weight was just too much for them. And it was like a slow sort of death to the death to, you know, a lot of the wood and the trees and so on. The coniferous trees, some of them uh, were also damaged, but uh, much less so. You know, they have, they seem to have the ability to, um, you know, the, the, uh, they have more resilience. And uh, I guess the rain, you know, the free, there, there's, uh, it's more distributed over the, I don't know. Um, anyway, the, they, the branches tend to just droop down, carry, you know, carrying the weight as opposed to, uh, they're not as extended as, as much from the stem of the tree. So the torque is much lower. Um, anyway, they're much more resilient. And uh, yeah, so, so this was sort of, and, and while this was going on, while this storm was going on, we experienced the phenomena, like I said in the intro, of, you know, of thunder, um, thunder freezing rain or thunder ice, and then thunder snow, and then thunder storms. Um, so the uh, thunder snow and thunder freezing rain, those are actually quite rare phenomena. You can think of them as uh, winter thunderstorms, if you like. So in order, to, in order to generate the thunder, the lightning and then the thunder, uh, you, need, you still need uh, convection, you need uh, strong upward motion. And uh, it's, so basically you need, you need the strong upward motion with the, with the cold sector, within a cold uh, sector of an extratropical cyclone. The top of the cumulonimbus cloud is quite low. Um, and uh, what you get is you get the, um, you basically get the snow or the grap grapple or the hail forming uh, within the storm. The, the heavy snowfall tends to muffle the sound of the thunder. So when you get these, this thunder snow, it sounds more like a low rumble instead of a loud, sharp, uh, you know, bang. Um, that you, you get in a regular thunderstorm. So this is, has to do with the acoustics of the, uh, you know, the snowflakes, because they definitely have, have a damping effect and they, they interrupt the, the passage of sound. So it kind of, uh, you know, they kind of, kind of make the sound much more of a rumble than, um, than, than a sharp uh, crack. Um, you basically, you still need a, layer of warm air above the colder surface in order to get the freezing rain. So, you know, the rain, uh, it, the, the precipitation is rain uh, from the warmer layer of air and it falls through into the cold area, becomes super cool droplets. And then when they hit the cold uh, surface, they, they freeze right on it. Um, or so you get the freezing rain or sleet if you like. And uh, that can actually, it's a very fine line. It's very hard for meteorologists to predict these ice storms. Of course, the, um, the largest one that um, happened in North America, you know, in recent times was in 1998. And that was a three day event and it knocked out power to many, many people uh, for, for several weeks. This storm had a significant effect on, on uh, power, it knocked out about 85,000 people um, were without power in Ottawa. Um, and uh, four days later, there's still, um, you know, five to 10,000 people in Ottawa without power. Now, as this storm moved to the northeast, um, it passed into the province of Quebec and uh, it, you know, it affected Montreal quite severely. So because uh, those areas are, a, a, are they're at slightly higher latitudes. 
the temperatures were slightly colder. So what we had as the torrential rain in the afternoon, they ended up getting as freezing rain. So their freezing rain event was much more significant than ours. It took down, it caused tremendous damage to trees all over. All over. And um, you know, a lot of the branches fell on power lines. So there was power out in, in the province of Quebec to 1.1 million people. Um, about half of the people in Montreal were actually without power. And it's taking a lot longer for power to be restored. So, uh, you know, that was Wednesday. You know, three days later, there's still, there's still about 300,000 people without power. And I believe that, you know, I think uh, the death toll has gone up to about three people that were hit, um, uh, somebody by a falling tree or falling massive branch. And uh, somebody, you know, wanted to win the Darwin Award and they brought their barbecue inside and started their barbecue up in an indoor environment. And of course, uh, you know, that uh, asphyxiated some people. So that's something, you know, you, you don't want to do, of course. So, um, there's three main, so, so these uh, thunder snow or thunder ice um, events are much more rare because you still require the convection, convective uplift in order to, uh, in order to get the, um, you know, hail or freezing rain, et cetera. Um, and you need a charge separation in order to get lightning and thunder. And uh, it's much harder to get a convective uplift um, in the winter, okay, because the, the air is cold and dense and, uh, you know, you need special conditions in order to, to get it to uplift. Um, so often, more often, thunder snow happens um, in a, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a, so basically in a, in a normal snowstorm with strong vertical mixing and uplift, for example, you know, a lake effect snow or an ocean effect where cold air passes over relatively warm water um, and uh, is, is driven upwards uh, by, by the, you know, normally cold air, it goes underneath the, the warm masses of air, but uh, conditions are such that, that uh, it, it, does, it does uplift in some cases, rare cases. So, so thunder snow is very rare. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so it's caused by the same mechanism as regular thunderstorms, but, you know, happening in the winter, and it's much rarer because the cold, dense air is less likely to rise, like I said. And you need uh, shear in order to generate these thunderstorms because otherwise the downdrafts will occur right over the same area as the updrafts and quench the storm. So you need um, shear, which is a change in wind speed uh, with height and um, the so so the shear you know it tilts over the cumulonimbus uh, thunder cloud the the convection uh, the region of convection is tilted over so that the updraft is at an angle through that convective region and then the downdraft uh, falls outside of that region so it doesn't self quench um, but if you have too much shear then it can rip the storm apart before it has enough time to develop. So you need shear of about, of, of less than 12 degrees. So, th so the wind speed, in other words, um, should change with altitude between say the ground and 2000 meters up by about 12 degrees or so. If it's less than that, that's sort of, a, you know, great conditions for the thunderstorm to uh, develop, but if it's more than 12 degrees, then it actually rips the storm apart and, and, and uh, prevents the development of a strong storm. Also, generally, you need, um, you know, the lake uh, effect storms that I was talking about, you need a temperature difference of uh, 25 degrees Celsius between the uh, lake temperature and the temperature at, at uh, a level of 1,500 meters, which is 4,900 feet. Um, that's the 850 uh, hexapascal level. And uh, you also need um, a, uh, the, the storm top, or basically it's called the echo top also, 
um, has to be um, about minus 30 degrees Celsius um, so that when the air rises up to that level, up to the top, there's no more supercooled water vapor. It's just ice crystals in the air at that elevation, at that altitude, so that you have an interaction of the ice up there, the ice crystals with the grapple. Now, grapple is basically, um, think of it as soft hail. It's what happens when you have uh, snowflakes and you have, then you have supercooled water which freezes onto the surface of the snowflakes um, and it makes these balls, you know, two to five millimeters diameter of, um, you know, sort of opaque rime, if you like. Um, you know, and some people say, well, grapple, you know, it's a new word. I haven't heard of that one, but grapple was first mentioned in an 1889 weather report. So it's like soft hail. Um, it's different from hail, which is hail is, is pure ice, but grapple is, is more of a mixture of of the um, ice coating snowflake, so it's it's uh, it doesn't it, it it's quite a different structure from from hail. But you need to have this, um, you know, when the interaction of the ice and grapple at elevation, it does generate a charge separation, electrical charge separation. So the electrons go to one level, and that leaves behind a positively charged upper level. And the electrons at the lower level then repel electrons on the ground, so the ground can become positive. And that, that does you have different circuits um, formed between uh, the bottom of the cloud, the bottom of the cumulonimbus cloud, and the ground. Um, strong charge separation, strong voltage can generate lightning. And then um, the thunder, of course, is the shock, the shock uh, wave that you hear. Um, from the lightning burst, or you can have, you know, lightning discharges um, between the bottom of the cloud and the top of the cloud. That can also occur. So, so uh, anyway, this, this storm was quite, um, quite intense, depending on you were. And, uh, you know, it is very rare, but uh, there, there is, you know, they seem to be happening a bit more often you know, uh, with uh, climate change, you know, so, so climate is always, uh, you know, a factor, you know, in most uh, weather events that we're, we're observing right now. So, so this is all, uh, these are all examples of, of weather weirding or weather wilding, if you like, you know, more and more extreme weather events uh, occurring. Okay, well, thank you for listening and we'll chat soon. Bye for now. Here's uh, Newton just out here behind me. So somewhere, there he is.